Hello and welcome to this webinar. I'm Deb Rogge, one of the professional development consultants at ESU8 in Neely. I'm going to discuss uh, text-dependent analysis in the classroom and uh, we're going to specifically focus on short answer questioning and uh, the students answering short answer questions. Uh, at the lower right hand corner of this screen you will see a Google address. There are resources there that are available for you to use in the classroom plus the passage that I'm referencing referencing today is available there plus other uh, text dependent analysis um, work that I have done. You're more than welcome to use this with your students in any which way or with your fellow teachers. Uh, thanks for being a part of this webinar today. Uh, today's webinar is um, addressing the Nebraska AQUEST tenets of assessment and educator effectiveness and um, the learning goals for this uh, webinar are to review what constitutes text dependent and then to learn the strategies to strengthen student skills and text dependent activities and then to understand basic principles of uh, text dependent analysis, multiple choice, short answer, and full length writings. But we are going to focus specifically in this webinar on short answer today. So why do we need to be concerned about text-dependent questions? Well, text-dependent questions make the learning that our students are doing visible. In other words, we don't just hope and pray that it's in their heads and, and that they know it or they've turned it into their long-term memory. It actually makes it visible because it's there on the paper. Um, we want to make sure that we're keeping our readers in the text, not out of the text. And one of the reasons that we want to make sure that they're in the text and not out is because if they can answer any question that you might uh, might present to them and they can answer that question with any previous experiences or previous knowledge that they have, then uh, the question is not dependent upon uh, the actual passage or passages that the students read. Because we really want to promote deeper thinking and critical examination of the text that they're reading and the answers that they're actually providing for us. Um, this movement moving towards uh, this type of writing or text-dependent writing comes from our higher education um, suggestion and what they suggested is that when the students get there they're able to summarize and they're able to offer them any other type of writing but when it comes to actually digging into the text which they've asked them to to read why they're not as strong or as able to do that now text dependent questions can be offered to students as young as kindergarten and all the way up into the 12th grade. So this uh, particular webinar is for all teachers at all grade levels. So you might be asking this question as to why does this matter to me? Well it matters to you because uh, in this moment right now we want to assure that our students are getting uh, deeper comprehension of the passages that we're asking them to read. In other words, many of you might be familiar with a term called close reading, C-L-O-S-E, reading. We want them to get into that passage so that they're actually reading it with depth and with um, a deeper sense of uh, attaching to the text than what we've asked our students to do in the past uh, when we ask them just knowledge and comprehension types of responses. We also want our students to have a deeper understanding of the structure of the modes of not only passages but the modes of writing because the type of writing that they're going to be here will be more in that that it's a dependent type of writing uh, as to what the uh, question item or stem or in this case um, the short response 
question is asking you to do, um, which then in, re in return gives the actual writing that they do a deeper, a deeper writing rather than at the surface, uh, at the knowledge and the comprehension comprehension areas. Now, we know that uh, today, in this moment right now, the purpose of this webinar is to uh, teach you, the teachers, and the students uh, the skills on how to approach text. And then we also know that with the revision of the 2014 Nebraska ELA College and Career Ready Standards, that it calls for us to be um, skillful at all grade levels, K through 12, in uh, text-dependent analysis. So if that's what we need to do in this moment right now, in the future, then we need to be able to have as uh, instructors or teachers ourselves and our students need to have the skill of interacting with the text in order to create a deeper understanding. So we also want those our students to be able to respond with confidence to the comprehension items or the text dependent items on the Nebraska State Assessment. So we need to look at a couple of examples or non-examples of text dependent um, questions that we might ask our, our students. This slide right here, on the left, uh, it gives you a, a non-example of a TDA, where on the right, we can see an example of a text dependent analysis item. Let's look closely at the item on the left. Let's read it for what it is. Listen while I read. It says, give three examples of how animals sleep in different ways. Okay, now let's move over and listen while I read the text-dependent analysis example. It says, both passages tell us about ways that different animals sleep in the wild. Explain why animals sleep in different ways. Write a well-organized response using specific evidence from both passages to support your answer. Now let's talk about the non-example on the left. It says, give three examples of how animals sleep in different ways. When the item is written in this manner, it allows the student to go into their prior knowledge, back into their own long-term memory, and recall ways or manners in which animals sleep in different ways. But when we look at the example TDA question over on the right, it gives us a lead-in about telling about different ways that animals sleep, and there are two passages that that uh, tell us about that. And then the student is given the task of explaining why animals sleep in different ways. It goes on to say, write a well-organized response using specific evidence. Now that's specific evidence from, and notice that both is in bold letters, passages to support your answer. So the student or the individual that's responding to this particular uh, item has to explain and they have to use uh, specific evidence and they have to find that evidence in both passages. So that's what makes it text dependent because in order to be able to accomplish this task, they have to go back into the text or both passages that they just read. Let's look at another uh, non-example and example. On the left again, we have a non-example. And it asks the uh, student to identify the literary devices the author uses in the story. Provide evidence from the story in your response. Now, here it says just to identify the literary devices. If your student is familiar with the literary devices, they can go from their memory and they can list those devices. And then they, they go in um, at the surface level just to find an evidence from the story. It's nothing, it's something that they could uh, have known from prior experiences or prior uh, instructional experiences um, about any of the literary devices. 
when we look at the text-dependent example, um, follow along while I read this one. Mood is the feeling or emotion that a reader experiences from a poem or story. Explain how the poet's word choice helps create mood throughout the poem. Write a well-organized response using specific evidence from the poem to support your answer. Now, right now, the difference between the non-example and the example is that it uh, the examples that identify specifically the literary device of mood. So they're only going to be working with that device. And in the second sentence, it asks, asks them again to explain the poet's word choice and how it creates mood throughout the poem. So that causes them to have to go back into the poem as well about the poet's word choice to create mood. Because the third sentence in uh, the prompt, or the question, tells the students to write a well-organized response using specific evidence from the poem to support your answer. And that is specific evidence of the poet's word choice to help create mood. So you see the example causes the student again to go back into the passage or the poem in order to be able to uh, create and draft and revise their answer. Whereas uh, the non-example offers any type of literary exam. It doesn't talk ex device. It doesn't talk about any special special device that they should work at and only provide evidence. So you know, so you can see how much more specific the text dependent analysis uh, requires the student to be as over uh, a non example what it require the student to to uh, create their answer. So what do text-dependent short item answers uh, look like? And overall, the uh, purpose or the task that students have to do is they will have to be able to respond in text-dependent short answer questions on informational or other genre passages. So, so we know that that is true. The su success criteria that we'll be looking for in our students and we'll share with our students is that their answer will include a rewording of the question, evidence from the article, and an appropriate citation of evidence of that source. So that's those are the three key things we're going to be looking for in that response from the student. Now, there is a short protocol or a formula that you can use with your students in order to answer short answer text-dependent items. Uh, First, it's very simple and very common, is to read the question or read the item. And then you, the student uh, or the writer needs to change the question into part of the answer, and they need to make sure that they write that down. And uh, if they're in a, uh, a situation uh, where, where they're answering on a, a like say the NISA or something, a piece of scratch paper will do that. But if you're doing practice or guided practice within the classroom, that can be just on a piece of any paper or it can be on a tablet. It can be on a um, uh, an erasable, uh, um, I'm trying losing the answer, but like a, a whiteboard or anything like that. So then, number three, they locate the evidence in the text that can be used in answering the question. Usually we ask uh, the students to either underline or list the evidence that they're going to use and highlight that. And even in the NISA, it's available for students to highlight or underline evidence. Then number four, they complete the answer. And there's two steps to completing the answer. They have to incorporate the evidence into their answer and they have to indicate the source of the evidence or where did they find that. So to wrap it all up, uh, the student needs to reread and fix up their answer. That means that they need to revise and they need to answer these two questions when they're revising. Does your answer answer the question? Does it make sense? And when they're editing, of course they need to be looking at those common uh, Sorts those common conventions of spelling, punctuation, and cal capitalization. If you 
uh, look at the uh, NDA TDA rubric, and I'm going to call that up here right now. The rubric uh, is in its draft form right now, and uh, it's in. It'll be in draft form. Let's see if it's get this down a little bit. There we go. It'll be in draft form until. Uh, uh, cut scores have been determined. But the most current form of the Nebraska TDA rubric is um, from August 1st of 2016. Now, we notice on this rubric that uh, it has four scoring points that our students can score at and it has three domains of which they are scored on. Each domain at each scoring point has uh, analysis of text and use of evidence, have three bullets, and writing skills have four bullets that we're looking at. Now, when you're looking at the Nebraska rubric, it's very important that we look at the underlined or keywords and the black bar. Um, a scoring point of one is minimal. So we look at all of these indicators in analysis of tests, text, use of evidence, and writing skills, and these are all identified as minimal. When we look at a level two performance, it is partially effective. Partially effective. So as we can see in analysis of text, addresses some parts of the task. So they're they're working on it. They have some. They're they're close to being effective, but they just don't have uh, all of it uh, addressed. Uh, integrates partially integrates evidence. Uh, partially provides some relevant and or accurate evidence from the text, uh, generates a partially focused response, so on and so forth. The level three is effective and effective, effective analysis, and so it addresses all parts of the task, that is an analysis of the text, use of evidence, and then the writing skills. So we have all of these indicators with each of those domains which tell us how our students perform. Then at the level four, it's exemplary. This, tell, this describes what an exemplary uh, uh, response uh, what qualities you'll see by all of the bullets are here. Now see, it thoroughly addresses all parts of the task. Thoroughly. Thorough. There's a thorough right here. Skillfully integrates. Uh, thoroughly supports the analysis. All of those. So when you're working with your students, the key words to remember are minimal, partially effective, effective, and exemplary. Those are the scoring points. Just to give you a little quick aside, uh, no, that's how you use, I'm not going to tell you that information right now. Uh, that's how you interpret and how you use this rubric. Um, let's go back to the PowerPoint. And... Here we go. Oh, oh, I see. Excuse me. I'm using a different. Okay. So we're answering and we're moving on. So we're going to use a passage. Actually, it's two passages called Adventurous Storyteller for uh, our short answer text dependent item uh, work today. Um, these are the three text dependent questions that we're going to be answering today. Uh, question number one is London caught the gold rush fever and in 1897 headed for Alaska. When did he not when he did not discover gold, what did he discover which was more valuable? The second TD item 
is what did London mean when he said, I would rather be a superb meteor, every atom of me in magnificent glow, than a sleepy and permanent planet. And the third uh, TD item is characterize the relationship between Buck and Curly and the other dogs on the Norwal. So I'll take you through the protocol that we had the short answer protocol here and we're going to go step by step through question one. All right now remember step one asked us to read the question so let's read the question. London caught the Cl Klondike gold rush fever and in 1897 headed for Alaska. When he did not discover gold what did he discover which was more valuable? Okay We've read the question. Step two is to change the question in parts of the answer and write it down. So the question was, when he did not discover, when he did not discover gold, what did he discover which was more val valuable? So you change the question to part of the answer. When London did not discover gold, he discovered, and I've written this down right here. It's right in front of me. If I was a student, I'd have it either on my, my uh, answer sheet or on a piece of uh, paper where I was working my answer through. Okay, let's continue to step three. Step three says to locate evidence in the text that can be used in answering the question. Underline or list the evidence. So I went back into the text and this is where I found the evidence that can be used in answering the question. And I underlined uh, the evidence that I found. Um, because it says uh, that London caught the gold, Klondike gold rush fever in 1897. He headed for Alaska. He didn't find gold, but he discovered something even more valuable. And the next sentence, what I underlined and highlighted here is what he found because he found that people enjoyed listening to the stories he made up with his vivid imagination. So that was step three to find my evidence. Now, I have to, in step four, complete my answer because first I need to indicate the answer, the evidence into my answer, and then also I need to incorporate the source of my evidence. Now, when you're writing a text dependent um, short answer, uh, and you don't have to be uh, like MLA style or uh, anything like that when you cite the source of your evidence. Notice here in my work I have uh, used a phrase according to the article that's where my evidence is and then again in the blue is when London did not discover goal he discovered and then I pulled directly from my text the answer the evidence of uh, of what he did not what he did discover. He discovered he could use his vivid imagination to create and tell stories to the people which they thoroughly enjoyed. So th that is real important because first of all I indicated the source of the evidence, uh, added it to my sentence starter where I reworded the question and then I incorporated the evidence into my answer. Now there are uh, in the resources that I have avail available for you, I have sentence starters. And um, if you've had an opportunity uh, to watch, here's uh, sentence starters for citing evidence. And you can share this with your students. You're able to uh, print it down. It's in the resources so you can get that. So notice that according to the text is the first item that I uh, offered to you, which is and I used in my response to the uh, question or the item. Uh, there are a lot of other ways and make sure that you model for your students and then you share with your students these different sentence starters and how you use them for citing the 
the evidence. Now, the citation for the evidence doesn't always have to be the first thing that comes. You can, it can be in another sentence found within the answer, or it can, just as long as the person who you are writing for uh, can know where you've uh, located your evidence. Okay. So then, remember in step remember in step five, we need to reread and fix up our answer. So first of all, we look at the revision part of it. Does your answer answer the question? Does it make sense? Well, okay, let's read through it. According to the article, when London did not discover gold, he discovered he could use his vivid imagination to create and tell stories to the people which they thoroughly enjoyed. Yes, there's a beginning and ending. I have my citation of where I found my evidence. Yeah, it looks pretty good to me. Then the next thing I need to do is edit. I need to check my spelling, my punctuation, and my capitalization. Capitalization. Let's look at that a little bit. Is there anything I did not do or where I could make it better? No. I think it looks pretty good right now. Okay, good. So we have answered question number one. So let's go on and let's look at the constructing the answer for item two. So read the question. What did London mean when he said, I would rather be a superb meteor, every atom of me in magnificent glow, than a sleepy and permanent planet? Okay, so remember step two was to reword the question to change it into part of the answer and write it down. So let me think about this. Okay, I think I'm going to do this. London's quote means. Now, re now notice, I didn't rewrite the quote or anything, but I referred to the quote. So I changed the question into part of the answer, and this is how I wrote it down. In step three, I need to locate evidence in the text that can be used in answering the question. Hmm, I need to remember to underline or list the evidence. Let's see. Let's find the evidence in the text. Okay, this is the text. It says, London resolved to live a full and exciting life. He once said, on and on and on and on and on. Oh, here's some evidence. Each day he pushed himself. Mm -hmm. And I read on, read on. His goal was to write at least 1,000 words every day. Okay. Also, it says he refused to stop even when he was sick. And he published 51 books and hundreds of articles. And was the best-selling and highest-paid highest author of his day. And people also considered him to be the best writer. All right. Now, there's quite a bit of evidence here that I can use. I probably want to think about uh, what specific evidence do I want to uh, share uh, as to what the quote means about I'd rather be a superb meteor and so on and so forth. So maybe, let's see, let's see. So in step four, I have to complete my answer. I have to incorporate the evidence into my answer and indicate the source of the evidence. So, let's see. What if I wrote it like this? The text says that each day he pushed himself. It goes on to share, London had a goal of writing at least 1,000 words a day. Because of, of his dedication to his work, he published 51 books and several articles. Finally, many people consider him to be one of the best American authors. Now, notice that I have in quoted, qu quoted here, I said the text said, I listed all of my answers, and, um, and that he never stood still. So I gave one, two, three, four, four pieces of evidence. Okay, and indicate the source of your evidence. I said, the text says, it goes on to share, and that puts me right back into the text. Okay. Okay. Okay, very good. All right, 
So let's go on to step five. We want to reread and fix up our answer. Means that we have to have revision and editing. Okay, let's look at it. Uh, is there capitalization? My spelling? How about my punctuation? Looks good. Okay, then I can move on to the next question. All right, so the third question that we had was to characterize the relationship between Buck and Curly and the other dogs on the Norwell. Here I have put the whole process on one page. Um, step one, remember, was to read the question, characterize the relationship between Buck and Curly and the other dogs on the Norwell. Uh, step two was to change the question into part of the answer and write it down. Um, uh, the excerpt from the book states the relationship between Buck and Curly and the other dogs on the Norwal was, and I need to identify my evidence. Um, so I had to go back into my uh, passage and find the evidence. Um, okay, so highlighted and underlined it are my other pieces of evidence that I found in order to characterize the relationship. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Okay. So, step four says I need to complete my answer by incorporating the evidence and indicating the source. So, it, I, this is what I wrote. It said the excerpt from the book states the relationship between Buck and Curly and the other dogs on the narwhal was that of you don't bother us, we won't bother you. The text says the big snow white fellow was friendly in a treacherous, treacherous short sort of way, while the other dog was gloomy and morose. He desired only to be left alone. Buck and Curly were on their own with no help or support from the other two dogs. Okay, so now step five says to reread and fix up our answer. So does the answer answer the question and does it make sense? And how's my spelling, punctuation, and my capitalization? Okay, so... Um, indicated the evidence. I used my quotes correctly. Um, commas, capital letters. Okay, spelling looks good. Okay, so then I can submit that answer. If you teach your children this or your students this process, they'll be much it'll be much easier for them to to craft a text dependent answer for the particular text dependent question they are asked to respond to. Okay, now remember that students need to be able to respond to text dependent short answer questions on an informational or other genre passage. I know this is a different way of looking at short answer, but think about this. When you have a student respond to a short answer question or item that you might have asked, and they only have to rely upon their knowledge with a single word, a phrase, or other, and not actually go back into the passage. They truly are not uh, doing a text-dependent short answer. Um, what you might want to do, if that's the case that you want, want to have those kind of uh, short answer where they use words or phrases, maybe you want to actually make those into fill-in-the-blanks or... Uh, word your item in such a way that your student knows that they need to cite evidence from the passage uh, when they write a text dependent and they have to be able to find the evidence there. Now remember that the success criteria for a text dependent short answer item is the answer will include a rewording of the question, the evidence from the article, and an appropriate citation of the evidence source. So I want to thank you again for uh, watching this uh, webinar on text-dependent uh, writing and writing a, to particularly a, a short answer text-dependent question or item. Uh, if you have any other questions or you have any other needs, don't hesitate to uh, tap into the 
uh, resource tool that I provide for you. And I also at this time want to remind you that in the description of this um, webinar, there is a Google link which will take you to uh, the resource tools if you go out to the web to find them. Thank you and we'll talk to you again soon.